Okay, uh, welcome all to AST uh, Career Day. Here is the uh, running order uh, for today. Um, I'll just have a few slides just to welcome you to the event, say a bit about the AST. And then we're going to kick off with Eric talking about growing test managers. Um, I'll do a kind of lightning talk about the approach I've taken to recruitment over the course of my uh, test manager uh, career has changed reasonably uh, significantly. Uh, Dan's going to tell us how he interviews testers. Ash will talk about advocating for testing. And I think also, from what you said the other day, advocating for testers, in particular yourself. Uh, Chris is going to tell us in and ask me anything about a couple of recent hiring rounds that he uh, gathered some statistical uh, data on. Uh, and then we'll all get back together for a, a panel discussion at the end. As you can see, it's kind of covering the full range of uh, recruitment and also career development um, that you might expect uh, for testers. We are the Association for Software Testing, and I know that some of you are already members, but let me just uh, remind you who we are and why we do what we do. Uh, we're a membership organization. We're a nonprofit. Um, we value both expertise and experience in testing. As it says on the slides there, we advocate for thinking testers and thoughtful testing. If you join us, you'll get discounts on our conferences and also uh, webinars like this, uh, and discounts on our black box software testing courses, which are really world renowned. Uh, along with that, there's also resources for new testers, and we have a Slack instance uh, where you can uh, chat uh, to your peers. Uh, CAST is a conference. Um, it's, again, like BBST, uh, really well known and well respected. I think it's different from other testing conferences that you might go to. In particular, it's got a peer focus and it's a lot about conferring, uh, you know, as the name might suggest in a conference. Uh, other places, maybe you get a couple of minutes of Q&A, uh, but at CAST, there really is something we call open season where there's a conversation about and around uh, whatever presentations are being made. Um, we're a not-for-profit organization and we run our conferences on a non-profit basis as well, which means we can kind of keep the prices down, but that doesn't compromise on the quality. We have high quality tutorials uh, from well-respected practitioners and the same goes for our keynotes and our other talks, although we do like to promote new speakers where we can. Uh, and so to do that, we'll have multiple tracks uh, and lightning talks. We want to hear and promote new voices and new perspectives in testing. Uh, one of the things that we're not going to do, though, uh, is sell keynotes or track sessions or attendee lists to any of the vendors or sponsors. And um, that's very much not what we're about. On the education side, the BBST, Black Box Software Testing Courses that I've mentioned, are cohort based, small cohort based, uh, very intensive four week courses. I've just finished a couple of months ago, the bug advocacy course myself, and I can highly recommend it. There's a great deal of breadth and depth uh, in these courses and being in a cohort with testing practitioners as your instructors is immensely valuable. Um, not only did I enjoy it, um, but even as a, you know, I've been in testing for 10 or 12 years or something, I still learn stuff along the way. Um, it really is deep and scholarships are available if uh, there are discounts for members, but um, if they're still kind of out of your uh, ability to pay, then get in touch with us because we, we do offer scholarships. Uh, we're a volunteer organisation and we're always looking for volunteers. A handful of the kind of places we'd look for volunteer help would be uh, BBST instruction. Um, you just need to have done the foundations course and a short instructor's course, and, and you can be a BBST instructor. Our technical team helps run the website and a variety of other things. We're always looking for assistance there and around CAST as well. Um, in fact, if, if you feel like you've got some free time and some motivation and want to do something, just please get in touch and we'll find something for you to do. Um, part of our mission, a significant part of our mission is promoting testing. And to that end, we offer grants uh, to pretty much anything that our members are uh, involved with that's, uh, you know, trying to promote testing. Uh, so events that are volunteer run, like tester meetups maybe, peer conferences, or, or, or even research. 
um, if you've got something that you think you would like our help with, again, please do get in touch because we're here to do that stuff. Uh, and a kind of dimension of that would be local chapters. Um, we are uh, building out groups in local areas, um, maybe with discounted memberships, if that's appropriate uh, for the economic status of the, uh, the country that the uh, chapters are in, certainly running local events, which will sponsor, help to organize and so on. Uh, if you're interested in starting a chapter wherever you are, again, please get in touch. Um, Armenia is, I think, our oldest uh, chapter and uh, doing well so far. Uh, the board. Uh, elections are coming up uh, shortly. The board are also volunteers. There are seven of us and we serve two year terms and each year half the board is up for re-election. So you'll run two year term, uh, but half the board changes uh, every year. Um, if you think you've got something that you can contribute, then we want to hear from you. Uh, we're always looking for fresh blood, fresh enthusiasm, new perspectives onto the board and we'll be opening uh, nominations uh, very soon. What will you get from it? Well, apart from the good feeling of being part of a, an organization that really means something, um, you'll get experience, uh, as it says here, running a nonprofit, but also uh, collaborating with other experienced testers that you can learn things from and taking on uh, and seeing through to completion um, projects, uh, stuff outside of work. Uh, even if uh, you see no other benefit, it's um, something you could put on your CV. That's kind of relevant to tonight, isn't it? CV points. And what else have we got coming up? Well, this year we made a commitment to ourselves and to you that we would put on something for our members every month. We haven't always been great at that in the past. This year we're, we're really we're really doing it. This is this month's event that you're at at the moment. Uh, and coming up soon, we've got uh, the first iteration for us of Rob Sabarin's uh, Just In Time Testing. That's a several week course with a couple of sessions uh, each week. Um, details of these things are on the website in our newsletter and so on um, as we uh, get them. In June, we'll have a tutorial with uh, Lisa Crispin and Melissa Eden, Growing a DevOps Culture, uh, Ways Testers Contribute. In July, um, for the first time, I think we'll be doing a board candidate forum. So people who put themselves forward for election uh, to the board this year will get together in some kind of AMA or something like that. Uh, in August, we're going to have some kind of hangout for members. We ran FICAs at the start of lockdown uh, and they went reasonably well. So we're going to bring back something like that. Uh, and then in the autumn, uh, in fall, we're really hopeful that we can do some kind of cast, maybe in person, clearly under um, careful, carefully orchestrated conditions. You know, we need to be safe, um, but we're really open. We can do something, even if small, uh, in person. And if we can't, then we'll back off to something virtual. And we're open if we do get in person, we'll do something virtual alongside it. So there's a lot of exciting stuff coming up from us in the forthcoming months. Uh, back to tonight, uh, we do have a code of conduct. Uh, by staying on the call after I finish speaking here, you, you agree to our code of conduct. You can find it on the website. Um, I think if I had to summarize it very uh, briefly, um, don't be a dick uh, is the, the uh, standard that we're looking for. Um, if we think that you are being, and I've got no reason to think anybody will be, then we reserve the right to, to boot you out. Okay, and that brings us back to the schedule. I'll just leave that on there for a moment. And I think Eric, you're gonna take over to facilitate. Great, and I will, and thank you. Okay. Um, I'll take over now. And let's get into it. Okay, so I wanna talk about growing test managers. Um, this is something that comes up um, for career progression for testers. Test managers is a very common uh, path. Um, I like that one better than the testers who move out of testing into other, into other fields. Um, I think that's one of the great things about testing is the kind of opportunities that um, it can open for you in adjacent areas. Uh, I'm always happy if someone from my team uh, becomes a developer or a uh, or a product owner, um, project manager less so. Um, so I'm, I'm currently a staff test engineer at Credit Karma, uh, and I'm serving as the VP of Marketing and Events for AST. Um, I've been on the board for this is my sixth and last year. Um, please, somebody 
uh, somebody come and run for the board who will pick up these events and keep making them fun for our members. It's I've, I've enjoyed it quite a lot, but it, it does take some work. Um, we need to talk about context before I can talk, tell you anything that happens in uh, anything else in my presentation. Um, the things that the, the experience I'm going to describe here, the things we did were a good fit for the context I was in. So um, it was a previous role of mine. I was a senior director in a testing organization reporting to a VP. And we had a, we had a large number of silos between functions, although um, the more organizations I've seen, the more common that appears. Uh, other than some radically flattened organizations, there's a lot of negotiating between functions to do things. Um, so the, the, you know, that, that, with that comes politics, with that becomes um, uh, marketing and trading and the things that um, need to be thought about at, uh, at a management level. Um, so yeah, there are lots of big companies that ha have things they call sprints. Um, so I like to say the most common agile implementation is scrum, but um, this one was scrum, but long-term planning and a long list of features that weren't prioritized. So it's a lot of pressure on releasing. These 17 features were promised by March 1st, they need to get out which created a lot of back and forth. Um, one of the things I don't love about test management is how often it just is project management and getting things done. Um, in this context, I had uh, six test managers in my org. A couple of them were senior managers who supervised other managers. Um, each one of the test managers would, would be responsible for three to five agile teams. So there would be one, two or three testers that were based on each team and then they would report to a test manager. In that shop, um, we were we had we had hit some apex of maximum exploratory and session-based test management. We had implemented that at scale. We'd even put that into our SOPs, so we were presenting it as a good practice to do um, session-based test management for exploratory testing. But the two things I see at that kind of scale are um, the pendulum towards automation back towards good exploratory testing. Um, we we had we had gotten pretty far to one way, and we were starting to come back towards automation. Um, I saw that my uh, I saw that this employer has now posted an automation architect job, so I'm guessing that we're accelerating towards um, creating a bunch of automation of some value. Um, the other thing I see is the um, centralized uh, quality function with its own management structure, back to splitting up testing amongst a bunch of different teams. Um, a, lot of, a, a lot of the time, um, people welcome somebody taking testing in hand and um, increasing the skills of the testers and making things work better. And sometimes um, they get frustrated and they, they just want testers to do what the engineering leaders tell them. Um, so in this case, we, we are still pretty solidly in the having a, um, having a VP of quality and getting to control how we did our testing. It was pretty, it was pretty cool. But in the situation with you know, 50 people and people who want to progress and want to um, get promoted and make more money, I like money, um, we would have to, we, we, I'd have to talk to them about what it is they could work on and how they could prepare to become a test manager. So one of the things that we had, uh, one of the things that we had implemented in, a, in that department of this size is something we call a career track, where we'd show, we'd show people what sort of skills um, we would want them to work on and then give them some um, ways to evaluate where they were in that progression. So they had seen something like this for, uh, for the IC roles, uh, individual contributor roles, about what the things are that I want them to focus on. So we didn't have anything formalized for test managers. So this is what I kind of came up with. I mean, these, are the, uh, these are seven areas where I think a uh, test manager needs to be um, need, needs to have, needs to have some expertise in, and um, behind this, um, uh, uh, there there are things like how to evaluate the different levels, what they mean. Um, I'm going to touch on them briefly, but if you're super interested in this, um, I wrote I wrote a longer paper for this, and then pulled it from a conference at the last minute. So I think I'm just going to post a Google Doc someday, um, if it's ever done. All right, so time for my presentation. I've already burned a third of it. Um, also, so much of test management, particularly in that context, was about planning and having things ready for getting a project done. But um, something, I, so the, the, the thing I would want a test manager to focus on is not just how do you make somebody stop yelling at you today? How do you solve problems over three months, six months, 12 months with your staffing? 
with how you get people lined up to take on projects, with deciding which projects people should work on, and being able to you know, being able to step back from um, getting thing get, you know get, getting work done and having spreadsheet lines to what's the right way for the people I'm responsible for to put them in work that's going to be meaningful for them to put people where they're going to do the most good for the organization um, to just to maximize uh, the productivity of the people that you're that you've been given this responsibility uh, to uh, to look after. Um, I need test managers uh, to be able to to think and analyze and break problems down and to not 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 just kind of pick up the collective hallucination of the rest of the project team. So sometimes that's um, that's command of detail. But sometimes that's also, you know, can you see what other people aren't seeing? And testers are awesome at that. I think um, some really uh, some really interesting lateral thinking comes out of letting testers look at larger problems. Now, to make this to make this uh, transition, they have to have you have to be able to have a tolerance for ambiguity. And anyone that's worked with testers realizes there's a significant portion of our profession that immediately is disqualified. <laughs> If the, the, the kind of person who would um, need a detailed specification to know what to test is going to have a really difficult time um, working as a manager without a lot of guardrails, um, with that, and, uh, needing to be flexible for the situation and understanding and understanding things. Um, not not being the person who knows more than anyone else, but being able to learn and be able to learn quickly. Um, you got to be able to chop it up. I mean, it's very important that uh, as a manager that you get information flowing around the organization. Um, I, I, when, I, when I'm trying to coach people to improve on this skill, I tell them that that is the circulatory system of an organization, is the information flowing around um, upwards, sideways between people who work in different functions so that we all understand what's happening and to your leaders so that they can support you. Um, often, uh, often you get people who are ready to talk. Um, it can be difficult to find people who are ready to listen. Um, and being able to communicate uh, and where, where the mess messages get messages get transmitted without creating bad feelings, without creating confrontations. Um, and then you know this this all comes down to collaboration. We have to we have to bring a team together to do more than we could do on our own. Um, the, there are skills under that. There are ways that you can teach people to be better at this. And it has to do with um, learning what people want, learning how to understand what people are really trying to accomplish, um, and learning how you can support them. Because you know, the, 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 it, it sounds like business school speak, but win-win is a real state that you are trying to get to. I get what I want, you get what, we want, what you want, we succeed together. To be able to figure out what it is that you can give people, you're going to have to, you're going to need a sense of empathy. You're going to need some way to under, to put, uh, be able to put yourself in their shoes and understand what sort of challenges they have. And some of those are some of those are very tactical. We need to get this project out because blah 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 revenue. Some of it is their boss is, yells at them about this project every day, so they're super sensitive to this. Or their boss's boss. This is the only time they ever see them, so they really want to do a good job on this. And then, yeah, there is some supervision involved. You know, you have to look in on the work that people are doing. Um, you can't do it from spreadsheets. You have to be able to do it from talking with people. Um, so once you do that and you stop pretending you can, you can, that the map is the territory, then you're going to have to learn how to delegate things. And that balance between um, letting people be accountable for things you've given them to work on and giving them good feedback and keeping them feeling like they're like that like they're still this is still up to them whether uh, how they succeed that's difficult it takes a, it takes a soft touch and to some extent if you're when you're uh, leading a team you are meant to um, kind of represent the values of the organization and the people that you're working with so I I make sure that um, the the managers I work with they have to lead with, do you need team time off? Do you have what you need? How are you doing? I tell them that you're, it's very unlikely that picking apart someone's project plan in the next 15 minutes is gonna make much of a difference. 
somebody has thought about this for some some multiple, perhaps with orders of, orders of magnitude more than you have. What you can do is listen to them. You can find out what it is that they need. You can give them some confidence. You can help. You can help them feel like they have your backing, so that they're allowed to go to their uh, their kids' recital or take a vacation. That's how. That that's actually where most. I think most of the good a leader can do is is helping their employees feel empowered and like that they they've got somebody in their corner. That makes way more of a difference than offering your insight. Um, so. Show them humility too. Um, I I try to declare my incompetence uh, as quickly as possible, um, just for the for the atmosphere in the room, so that people are willing to admit what they know and they don't know, but also to you know try to try to be an example. Hey, give me some feedback. Did I handle that well? How would you like to see this gone differently? I want I want people to see. Uh, oops. Hey, a little latecomer. Um, I want people to uh, I want people to see uh, the behavior I want them to do. I don't want to be somebody different than them and and uh, claim that I've got all the answers because I don't and neither does anyone else. And as long as you feel like you have to pretend that you do, we're gonna have a hard time learning. Okay, um, so some things about um, finding future leaders. Um, so that humility and willing to be wrong, um, I think that's super important. People who think they know everything and that are very difficult to reach or give feedback to are really hard to, to help improve and to um, help them navigate the waters of management. So you don't always need the same thing at the same time. So you have to be able to have some, you have to be able to learn from things. You have to, you have to be willing to shift uh, how you approach problems. And if you're sure that you know everything, you're going to be really hard to work with. Um, people who are pairing across functions, particularly if it's informal, that to me is a way that they're demonstrating skills in um, collaboration. It's always something I look for. Um, being good at communication. Okay, not just the person who talks a lot in the meeting, although those people usually do pretty well, particularly if they're mediocre white men. But can they also report and pull out the um, important points of what's going on? Can they give you a briefing of um, what what are the three most important things I need to know, and can they do can they do that in under seventeen minutes? Um, ramblers aren't always helpful. Um, being concise and explain to me exp being able to explain to up your management chain what really matters right now is super important. Um, I also look for someone who can put themselves in uh, another person's shoes and tell me um, what they think that is important to them, as I talked about earlier. Uh, people who get locked in are very hard to are, have a hard time succeeding in management. Sometimes stubbornness, um, it works at like the Steve Jobs CTO level, sort of, except your people hate you. It definitely doesn't work at like a, te a line test manager. You need to be able to um, understand a problem by seeing it from more than one direction. Uh, so when I've got somebody I think is a good candidate, um, I might debrief with them. Like, bring them to a meeting where that's a cross-functional meeting, watch the discussion and say, okay, what did you see? What do you think is important to the people there? And then by talking through that and um, you know, helping them understand what got decided in that meeting, what was the context that was brought into the meeting, what's, what, what might happen next. Um, I'm both getting a chance to assess what they're seeing and getting a chance to uh, coach them a little bit. Um, I try to share decisions with my staff whenever possible. Um, I try not to make decisions on my own, um, particularly if they impact people. Um, sometimes that can take too long. Uh, people who with a, with a low tolerance for ambiguity might just say at some point, tell me what you want. Well, okay, I will if you want, but the outcome I would rather have is have somebody who's going to be affected by the decision choose and then support them. So that, 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 that gets accountability, that gets buy-in all at once. Um, and then you know I have to you, I have to work on people's confidence and help them get ready. Um, I'm very proud of my record in helping uh, helping women and women of color get uh, get into into their first management position. Um, that it, it, to do that, I've had to um, talk to them about well you know you you should speak up at this point when when staffing is getting assigned because that's what, you know, the, as a manager, it's important that you inje inject yourself and say, actually, no, that's not okay. We need to do this instead. Um, so get them ready, 
um, get them confident, get them feeling like they're they can do this job. And then you know to, you got the, the the opportunities show up when they show up. You don't get to pick always when a management position opens up. You get budget or somebody leaves, so you get somebody ready. The more time that goes on, the more ready they are. Um, and hopefully, they're in the right position to seize that opportunity. They're going to have to interview with other people. Um, hopefully, if you've got them ready, then they're going to kill it. Red flags. Some people should not be managers, especially people that want to be managers. Um, if they want it for the power, even if they think it can help them fix things, they're probably not going to be good at it. Uh, that's not, I, I, I find that management means even less control over outcomes, um, direct control. Um, I have the opportunity to influence, I have the opportunity to shape things. I can ask people to focus on certain things, but it's kind of out of my hands. Other people are doing the work. And as I said before, anyone who, anyone who, who, who argues with your feedback uh, is probably you're going to have trouble with. Um, people who are people who have a real hard time showing humility or showing vulnerability, I don't think are great man. I don't think can become good managers because uh, it just becomes too difficult to deal with them day to day. Uh, be, I I really like seeing people who are vulnerable and are willing to admit what they don't know and what they need to work on. Okay, uh, so we, when I get a new manager, I try to get out of the way and give them space and let them let let, let things happen. There will be some mistakes. There will be a learning curve. Um, at this point, once they're a new manager, I start to be very careful about how much feedback I offer um, because I don't, I don't, I need that, I need their, their confidence to stay up. I need them to, to feel like they can figure this out. Um, and I try to keep them, um, I try to, I try to keep them feeling like they've got the backing that they need, that that's unwavering, that they've got time to figure things out and that it's going to be okay. And that helps people build up confidence and move forward. Oh, and then the only real hack I have to offer is all of my one-on-ones, there's a Google Doc in the uh, linked in the agenda. It has dates and we add things to it and we take notes in it. And then, so whenever time I think, oh, I would like to talk to so-and-so about this, I can put that in the agenda. And then before our next meeting, they will look at it and see what I wanted to talk about, or they can put in things that they want to talk about and I will see it. And then we're able to have productive conversations. So uh, what I'll leave you with is if you're thinking about being a test manager, you should think about why. I mean, really, why? Like, money's good, but then you have to work way harder and you have less control over outcomes and it's way more stressful. You might think you want this and, you know, it, it's, it's, good to, it's good to move along. It's good to have something to grow towards. But it's an orthogonal set of skills to what, um, what, you, what you worked on as an individual contributor. Yes, there are things that translate, like a tolerance for ambiguity and being able to see patterns and things that um, are that that are not obvious. But it's you know, learning to deal with people all the time. It's rough on me as an introvert. It's uh, the thing that exhausts my energy. Um, I feel I I think that working as a senior leader and going meeting 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 all day um, probably shortened my life. It was a, it was a lot. Uh, so I probably will do it again, but um, it's hard work. So be sure. Um, getting good at coaching people and accepting coaching is going to, at least as you might hear, it can help with me. It helps with, every, it helps with everyone else too, I think though. Um, practice reporting is probably the one skill I would ask people to focus on the most. Concise, what happened, this is what happened, this is what we focus on, we focus on next. And then just be open, tell your, man, tell your manager, tell the people you're working with, these are my ambitions, this is what I would like to do, what do you think I should work on? And you might get some good feedback. You might find out that this is not going to happen for you in this place, and you might and you need to look elsewhere. That's okay, but anytime you can get information like that, you're going to be better off. Be open about what it is that you're hoping for. Get on the radar so that people think about you when it's time to when they're thinking about developing their leaders. Uh, conclusions. I guess that will be up to you to bring back to me at the question period at the end of the presentation. At the end, sorry, at the end of the session, I have a few more people to get to. Um, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, I'd love to talk to you any other time. If you have more questions, I can send you the expanded version of this in a, uh, in a paper form, as I said. So what is next? Thank you, Smyarik. I think so too.
Okay, uh, let me just set this up. You caught me by surprise there. I thought you were going to uh, intro. Uh, let's see, share screen. Okay, well, so please welcome to the stage, my friend James <laughs> Thomas, uh, known on Twitter as QA Hiccups. Uh, also, always good with a dad joke or a pun, uh, but a very thoughtful, uh, a very thoughtful person that I really enjoyed being on the AST board with um, because of his unique perspective and the way he thinks deeply about things that and finds new ways to examine them um, that the other people on the board have not yet detected. He is a real pleasure to work with and a great thinker. So I'm really glad he's here. Uh, thanks very much. That's and then you're going to have to explain well. testing versus chicken. I can't do anything <laughs> with that. Uh, okay. So yeah, I am James Thomas. I'm a, a senior quality engineer. Or the in my head, I'm still a tester at uh, Ida Health. Uh, they're a Berlin-based company, and, and Dan works there too. Uh, but I'm based in Cambridge in the uh, UK. Uh, and today, under the title uh, Testing versus Chicken, I'm going to talk about how my approach to test recruitment changed over the course of my uh, management career. Um, I've probably spent about 15 years uh, recruiting, doing technical recruitment. Um, mostly developers, technical authors, and testers, uh, with a real focus on testers for the last 10 years of, of that period. And one of the things that I uh, found when uh, I was recruiting was this kind of chicken and egg situation. So on the one side, you would get uh, HR or, or talent acquisition, as they've become known, at least in the UK uh, these days. And they would say, uh, James, just Tell us exactly what it is that you want in excruciating detail, uh, and then we'll go out and find it for you. Just tell us what you want. Uh, and I would say, um, well, that, that's okay, but really I want some idea of what's out there because I have some flexibility about how I can arrange uh, the testing work. And so I want some idea of what's out there so I can shape it to fit what's available. Uh, and I would say, well, you know, before we can go and look, you've got to tell us what you want. And I would say, yeah, but uh, before I can tell you what I want, I'd, you know, I'd like you to go and look and find out what's there. Uh, and that's a pretty circular, going nowhere conversation. Uh, I've managed to square the circle uh, usually with a, a great deal of stubbornness and also a kind of compromise where I would give something that looks reasonably specific, uh, but in fact can't be evaluated uh, by an, an algorithm uh, and instead requires a bit of human intervention. And let, let me give you an example. Uh, on the left there is a job advert uh, that, that I wrote, or kind of a piece of a job advert that I wrote for Lingramatics. So I worked at a company called Lingramatics uh, until a couple of months ago. And uh, on the right is the job advert uh, that uh, Dan wrote for the job that I've taken at Ada. And now neither of these um, job adverts have got anything like must have spent five years testing React Native uh, applications under Node version whatever uh, on Windows XP. You know, there's nothing as specific as that. There are certainly things that you're going to need if you want this job, um, but they're a lot more objective in terms of being evaluated. And I can tell you that I wouldn't have taken the job that I took had it got one of those excruciatingly specific job adverts. I want to keep my options open as a hiring manager. I want to give myself a chance to find good people and, and have, maybe have some surprises uh, during the uh, recruitment process, find something I didn't think I was looking for that I now realize is, is going to fit really well. Uh, and that means that I'm going to be asking myself during the recruitment process, what can I do as a recruiter to understand the potential of a candidate and how they might fit? Uh, and to do that, I have a model, and I call it uh, the egg of testing recruitment. It's got two pieces. Uh, the yoke, that's the core skills, the stuff that if you're going to be a tester, you've, you've just got to have this stuff. You've got to have these skills. Uh, and the white, you can think of those as the horizontal skills, if you like. Uh, it maps onto the kind of T-shaped uh, model, if you're familiar with that, so I think reasonably well. Uh, they're the supporting skills, uh, things, you know, the st stuff that enables you to do a good job with your skill, uh, with your core skills, um, being able to uh, report well, um, uh, show empathy, those kind of things. Now, some people will tell you that uh, recruitment is easy. 
Um, but some people would tell you that it's easy to cook an egg. And um, I don't believe that's true. And in fact, that picture on the right there um, is from my kitchen. So I know it's not true. You can go wrong with cooking an egg and you can definitely go wrong uh, with recruitments. But what makes it difficult? Well, it is a handful of factors uh, that make uh, recruitment difficult. Um, there are multiple things in play simultaneously that could be important. What skills does the candidate have? What experience do they have? Um, how likely are they to apply those in your context? How well do you think they'll apply them in your context? How will they fit with the team? What opportunities for them have you got available? What other opportunities are people in your team looking for that this new person could enable? Uh, what does the candidate want in terms of money or other benefits or career progression? All of those things are important to somebody at some time during the recruitment process. Now, you've also only got a limited amount of time to speak to candidates, particularly the good ones, because they're likely to get snapped up really quickly by your um, competitors. So there's time pressure. Now, you've only got a limited number of engagements as well. You can maybe have a phone screen, perhaps you get some kind of technical task uh, and some kind of face-to-face, -face, but um, you really don't get many opportunities to speak. You will have a space of reasonable outcomes. I've talked about this already. Um, you might be able to take uh, somebody from your team and put them in a different position uh, to make room for uh, the candidate that's coming. You could juggle people uh, because this new candidate's got a skill that you didn't think you needed, but you can now see an opportunity to use it. And it's a dynamic feedback system as a recruiter. Um, if you go on and on about exploratory testing, let's say, don't be surprised if all the candidates start talking about how all the work they've done was exploratory. And this started to feel to me when I kind of realized this kind of stuff as I worked my way through uh, my kind of hiring career, started to feel to me uh, a lot like testing. Th these are kind of constraints and problems that I experience when I'm testing an application as well. And it occurred to me that when I first started my uh, career as a recruiting manager, I was doing a lot of very confirmatory checking of the candidates. Uh, I would take the CV and essentially I would work through it in chronological order, asking confirmatory questions. And I don't think I found out very much. It certainly wasn't very enjoyable. Uh, and I imagine it wasn't very enjoyable for the candidates. And what I've come to is that now I want to explore the candidates. I want to test them. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that next. So the, the journey here for me is from testing to checking, or from, uh, from checking to testing the candidates, uh, kind of a bit like uh, the sort of testing field itself. So if I'm testing, then I'm gonna want a mission. And this is the mission. Uh, I'm gonna explore the candidates using the materials that they supply and conversation and exercises uh, to gauge their suitability for the role that I've got open. Um, let's talk about the materials. Roughly speaking, these are the kind of things that you can expect in a recruitment process. Maybe a cover letter, CV, a phone interview, technical task, some kind of face-to-face. -face. That's the top row. And then maybe, depending on the candidates, they'll have uh, social media, perhaps a blog, maybe a personal website, and perhaps they'll have done some kind of open source projects. All of those things are data. And you can apply the model to them. Uh, if they're talking about testing skills on their blog uh, and the kind of testing that they've done, you can evaluate that given the evidence that they've got uh, there for you. You can look at if the blog's reasonably long-lived and well-populated. You can look at the evolution of their train of thought. Uh, and, uh, for example, uh, you can see how well they write. Is it really verbose? Is it concise? The kind of things that uh, Eric was talking about can be on display in, in these kind of materials. Um, I'll just briefly talk about cover letters. Uh, I think... It's probably unfashionable uh, to say, but I love a cover letter. And uh, as both as a candidate and as a hiring manager, uh, and the reason that I do is that it's first-hand data. Uh, it's an opportunity for the candidate to say to the hiring manager, this is what I think your role is. This is how I think I fit it. And this is the value that I think I'm going to bring. It's not mediated by any other um, format or other person. It's a it's direct first-hand data. 
typically the agency or the rec recruiters inside the company won't look at it. So um, if you only take one thing away from this talk, and it's nothing to do with the, the kind of main thrust, cover letters are brilliant. So the egg attested recruitment, uh, how does that help in the uh, non-written parts of the interview? Well, I'm going to be looking at the yolk uh, and the egg. Uh, the yolk, I'm looking for the kind of things that you can see uh, on the left there. And the way that I'm going to explore those things typically is by putting the candidate in scenarios. And there'll be scenarios where the candidate doesn't have all of the information so that they have to um, explore that scenario. And I can begin to explore them while they do it. Um, if you were uh, an actor, you kind of put this in a different context, and you went for an audition, uh, you wouldn't be expected to perform an entire play, uh, but you would be expected to act from a, you know, a short extract from a play, a little script that's been uh, given to you on the spot. And I see this as, as very similar. I can't have you set up and you know, do kind of full-on testing of anything for any length of time, but I can give you something that's a bit of a facsimile of that that gives me an idea of how you might perform. Uh, when you do test. So in this situation, what would you, you haven't got enough information here, so tell me, where would you start? Um, and could you report now, please? What have you found? I wanna know what kind of caveats they're gonna make. I'm gonna wanna know who, who they're gonna ask questions of, uh, what compromises they're prepared to make when they're under time pressure in the scenario. Those kind of things are all interesting to know. Uh, what about the whites? Well, I mentioned earlier, this is about uh, reporting it's about behavior do they get angry when when challenged and you know in an interview typically i will challenge because that's an interesting dimension of of the audition do they get really shirty do they take it really well do they push back you know that might be appropriate and uh, and welcomed can they go broad and deep when asked um how, how does their personality fit I and mean, you're not always looking for identical testers you might want an opposite um in, in terms of fit uh, and useful questions in this aspect are, tell me about a time when uh, tell me about a time when the value of your testing was challenged how did you deal with that of course in the real world uh, the the model isn't quite as uh, sweet as it looked in the first picture of it it's, it's all really messy the yolk and the egg are typically uh, mashed up together uh, but that's okay because during the interview i can be uh, looking for um, information about both of them at once when the candidate's giving me an answer uh, about uh, you know how, how they would test the in the scenario that I've given them, I can also be looking about the way they're talking about it. So form and content come together. Okay, so almost at the end, back at the start now, HR asking me, how are you going to tell whether these candidates are any good if you haven't given us the checks to perform? And I'll say, well, I'm going I'm going to know my mission and i'm going to audition the testers and then i'm going to explore them just like i would uh, when i'm uh, essentially auditioning a piece of software thanks very much and back to you eric thank you james Uh, as Ash pointed out, eggs are super hard to cook properly. Um, watch one of those videos on how to make a perfect omelet sometime if you want to be humbled. You've been doing it wrong. Okay, so next up is is Dan Ashby. Um, I think we're, uh, I, I, I think I probably am going to fumble a great introduction for Dan as well. Um, I, do, I, do, I do know that I've been observing Dan in our community for many years, and I greatly respect what he's done writing, speaking, and community building. Um, he's definitely a real star, and I'm 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 very thankful he agreed to help us out today and come talk to us about interviewing testers. So I'll pass it off to Dan now. Thank you so much. You can hear me okay? Yeah. Let me show that you can hear me. We can. Nice. Okay. Excellent. Go. Um. Right. Oh. Yeah. My slides are sharing now. It should. Should be sharing. Uh, let me just. Uh, they are. Hide this. Right, cool. Okay, cool. So, in a similar sort of thread to James, uh, I'm going to talk about interviewing. And I'm going to dive in a little bit around the parts of interviewing and specifically talk about how I interview. Um, so, I'm just going to jump in since the, the intro was already there. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, here's a loose agenda. I'm going to fly through this. We've got 20 minutes. I'll probably take that. So 
I mean, feel free to ask questions if you want to store them up and ask them at the end. If we've got some time, that would be that would be good. So we're going to talk about context, then uh, uh, resumes or CVs. Uh, so how I assess resumes, but also the importance of them as part of the interviewing process. I'll talk about the interviews themselves um, and different aspects of that, and then the level the level of the candidates that come through. So like interviews for for me in my context tend to be quite level agnostic because we've got lots of roles open so um as part of the interview i'll assess where this candidate might fit if they're if they're a good fit for the company so we'll talk about that in terms of our career uh pathway and framework that we use as well so context um there uh so essentially setting up the needs of the role and writing a job spec uh, and structuring the interview process uh, all require an understanding of the context of the role, context of the org, the teams that require a tester to join them. Uh, so context is really important, right? Different teams have different needs uh, related to testing skills and testing knowledge and even fluency and talking about testing. Um, there's different approaches that they use. There's some autonomy there. So each sort of, um, the way that we sort of mold job specs should really detail the context of the role, the context of the organization covering these things, the business domain, the tech domain, our strategies and culture and ways of working that we want people to align with as, as they come in, right? Um, so as a candidate, this is your opportunity to analyze job specs, right? Discover the context of the role, check if it suits your own, your own context, your own needs, knowledge, skills, experience, mindset, um, and also relates to what you want to do, what you want to do from a career perspective. So context is important. Um, and likewise with a resume, right? In the same way that uh, we should be analysing the job specs, or candidates analyse job specs to discover the context of the role. The companies analyse resumes or CVs uh, to discover the context around the candidates, right? The skills, impact, values and principles, knowledge, um, experience, fluency, all this kind of stuff. Showing your work. This is what you do in a resume, right? Here's, uh, here's mine. This is at least the top half. <laughs> the top half of page one, there's two pages. Page two talks about more about the, my experiences, my education, some achievements, some links to some repos that show my work, essentially, but kind of like a testing portfolio. You can see from this top half that I have um, the three focused areas, my, my profile description, my personal values, key skills, my employment history. Uh, but in my employment history, I'm not just talking about my tasks and my objectives that I've met, but actually I find it super important to talk about impact. Uh, and I'll speak a little bit more about impact as part of interviews uh, in a later slide. So, um, but the key thing here is relating this to interviews, right? Um, your CV, your resume, it's, it's potentially the first thing that an interviewer will see relating to, to you, right? Unless you have a cover letter. James, I, I don't really do cover letters. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, uh, um, but yeah, the CV or cover letter, same thing. This is typically the first thing that the person that's going to be interviewing you or the people that will interview you will see. So that sets the context in their mind. Um, and it's the predominant thing that they'll stem conversations from as well, typically, right? Be that forming scenarios like James just said, those form, those scenarios will be related to the company's needs, but also what's on your CV as well. Uh, almost like testing, testing that what you're saying is true. Um, so those conversations, like for me, it's very, like, similar to what James was saying as well, it's very easy for people to go in with checklists, checklists of questions. We must ask these questions and write down the answers. But that makes an interview really difficult for, for either person in the interview, that either the, the person, the candidate being interviewed, or the interviewer as well. Because 
unless you're actually having a conversation with that person, you, you can't really get to know them. You can't really discover whether it's someone that you would want to work with. What's their attitude, their behavior, and um, the fluency in having a conversation about their craft, right? About the role that you need to, to, to fill ultimately and how they can help make that impact there. So it's important to get conversational. Um, the candidate's answer to an initial question will help them to stem conversations about topics. So you still have questions, you still um, ask questions, but it shouldn't just be question, answer, question, answer. Ask follow-on questions and share your opinions and have conversations as well. And in that way, you're going to relax the candidate. They're going to see it's conversational, so they'll share more information, which is going to be super valuable. Okay, um, as part of interviewing as well for a tester role, it's important to remember that this person isn't just going to be a tester, right? This is my Tina, the tester model. So Tina's a tester and a team working on a product or a platform and a department or an office or perhaps remote, but have people in the same location maybe. Um, and as part of the organization and beyond this, Tina is also part of the community, perhaps, the industry as a whole. And there's lots of different skills and techniques and tools and experience that these candidates will have and all these other things so we can't just look at interviewing testers as being hey are you a good tester do you have tester skills well part of being a, a good tester is the collaboration and working with other people that are non-testers and helping out with other activities that are non-testing activities and understanding agile and ways of working as a team and how to report upwards to maybe exec level people perhaps um get involved in company events and company initiatives outside of testing so we kind of have to assess these skills across all of these areas right so it's not just testing skills but team skills product skills platform skills etc and then for each of these things that you think of as being important within your context then Perhaps you might want to put the Dreyfus model scale on there, so from novice to expert, and in that way you can um, you can stem your conversations around that and help to build in your your mind a model of where the the, the candidate might fit within the, the organisation, what level they would be at. Are they going to be someone that can come in and teach more senior level, who can coach and mentor maybe junior people, or are they going to come in and act as a coach at that level so maybe cut across multiple teams there's lots of different variables here right but what i'm trying to get to with this model is break out of the thinking that um, as an interviewer you're just hiring a tester but also as a candidate break out of the thinking that you're just going for a testing role like you're going to be involved in a team that does a whole load of other different activities and you're going to be able to help them with those activities and impact them still using your testing mindset your lateral critical thinking skills, your communication and influence skills, but on different things that isn't software. So have a think about that and talk about the impact that you've made there as well. Talk about the, the things that you've done as uh, cutting across all these different things too. This is a mind map that I created a while ago, actually. I put it in a blog and uh, a lot of people ended up starting using it, but I think a lot of people misuse this. It's just... It's a mind map that's to be used as a heuristic. If you're struggling to form conversations, struggling, struggling to, uh, struggling, sorry, to think about uh, uh, different areas of conversation to dive into, then this, these things are heuristics, right? So obviously they start start at the top right. So introduction, tell us your story of becoming a tester is always a great way to to start a conversation. Um, then you can talk about testing knowledge or misconceptions within the craft. Everybody's got stories to share around misconceptions that they've had to deal with, right? Uh, as part of your craft growing up. Um, so again, that's good for forming conversations. You get to know how the person has made an impact in solving some of those problems in their workplace or, or not. Maybe, maybe they, they haven't found a way to solve those problems and then you can perhaps share stories on how you might solve them. See how they respond, if they get a learning mindset, are they taking on board what you're saying? You can see what I'm saying about conversations, right? So this is not a checklist just to tick the boxes, risks. Yes, they know about this, tick, you know, it's conversations. 
Uh, impact. I mentioned impact when I spoke about resumes, um, but it's another area of that I'll really like to dive into in terms of when I'm running, conducting interviews. But even if I'm a candidate um, and I'm applying for a job, I think I think it's so important to talk about impact. Having a discussion about the impact takes it to that ne next level, right? For me, impact's the motivator. It lets me see uh, people's passion for their craft. And think about this, like everybody, everybody tends to talk about goals and objectives, uh, KPIs or OKRs, um, but impact takes it to that next level. Now, I'm going to share a, I've got to share a very quick example. Uh, lame sports analogy that's not football, I'm going to use swimming, right? If you had an objective to swim uh, one length, to be the fastest swimmer to swim one length of a swimming pool, right? Um, you, that's your objective. You would set that objective. You might have some goals around training regimes. You might have goals around hiring a training team and um, putting time and effort in, all that kind of stuff, so you can meet that objective. But where's the, where's the motivation there? Where's the impact, right? If you actually put the lens on impact around how you're impacting people, then in this example, you're thinking about um, how you impact the next generation of children that want to get into swimming, or how you impact your training team that have helped you achieve becoming the fastest swimmer. How you impact yourself, your personal brand, your reputation, or your friends and family and, and from a sense of pride, from them supporting you to get that fastest leg or how you impact your competitors to up their game, which in turn impacts yourself to up your game, right? If you're putting all that information into your CV and into the conversations and in your interview as a candidate, your, your, your passion is going to come out. You're showing actually how you've made that impact in your working context previously. But then you're also implicitly talking about how you can help this organization, how, what impact you have experience in making to make the same impact in this organization. And if you're an interviewer, if you're not talking about impact, you're not going to get any of this information. It's going to be, it's going to be quite hard. Um, okay, um, short on time, I think. Let me talk about space. <laughs> uh, it's so important for interviewers to give space to candidates during the interview as well. Um, I actually rejected a role at Amazon because uh, this was before I joined Ada, uh, because in a full day's interview, there was five different sessions, six or seven different people, and they gave me a grand, a grand total of 20 minutes to ask questions, to learn about the role, to learn about the company culture, the team that I'd be joining, the product areas that I'd be working on. It's not good, right? I can't assess the company. Um, and I, from the 20 minutes that I got, I didn't really enjoy the answers. So I felt like that role wasn't for me. And then there was more opportunities in pipeline that were giving me more space to, to, um, to assess the company. Like James was saying, uh, interviewing is like testing. So I'm testing the organization as an interviewee, as a candidate, just like the, the organization is testing me as a candidate. Um, or if I'm the interviewer, I, I'm testing the candidates himself. Uh, but you have to give space both ways, right? Especially in the context of uh, testing, testing rules, testing is about questioning. Um, so when I've interviewed testers, I'd be very surprised if candidates don't have any questions. Um, interviewing is like testing, right? You're assessing the company or um, you're trying to find out if this is a place that you would like to work. So space is important as well. So different formats that I've used, I'm just going to open up this one as well. Um, so ADA, we've got three different rounds. Initially, I would do the first round and I'd talk about testing equality. I'm testing the candidate. They are testing me as well around the strategies at ADA for testing equality. Second round would be with uh, a PO, an engineer manager, uh, potential a quality engineer as well, and they would discuss the, the context of the business, the organization, the products, um, the, the tech domain. Then a final round would be with the team uh, that you would be joining um, to discuss the team's context and work and really get to know those people so that you can 
find out if they're people that you would like to work with and they can find out if you're someone that they would like to join the team as well. So we plan to keep it really simple. In the past, I've also used testing puzzles. Initially, I really enjoyed using testing puzzles, but then uh, there was some, some situations where people were struggling with the puzzle, but it was because I hadn't really explained it properly or people, there was a time where someone misunderstood maybe based on my accent which was a challenge. So they tested something else when they, it was different to what I was asking them to test. Uh, so I, I found testing puzzles can be quite challenging. So I've put them to one side. If I'm sitting on the fence after the first initial call, then I might introduce a puzzle and watch them and help them through the puzzle. Um, but if I'm not on the fence, I'm not gonna, not gonna do that. And also in a past company, we also did something called a sprint in a day. So the final round was to come in and actually pair uh, with developers and testers and do some work in a day. It was it wasn't actual real product work within that company. It was uh, like a mock scenarios, a mock product, but just generally so that they could see how we work and we could see how they work. So there would be a planning session. There would be peer development session, there would be peer testing sessions, um, and then there would be a, a sort of uh, report sort of presentation at the end. We would talk about Agile as well. So that worked quite well, but it consumed a lot of people's time. Um, the candidates, I'm pretty sure, were quite tired by the end of the day. <laughs> so um, I haven't introduced that at other companies that I've worked at. But it worked quite well in that context and we had the time to be able to afford to do that as well as, as teams. So that's some formats. Uh, right, so the level of a tester, what level of tester is the candidate? Um, so Ada and a past companies, I've, uh, I, said, I said previously, I tried to keep the job ad level quite agnostic. So basically, I don't want to constrain myself by saying um, this is a senior tester role, this is a mid-level role, or junior, because typically we would we would have more than one role open. Uh, either we've got multiple roles open, so uh, we'll push out a, a try to be general with the job spec and uh, agnostic in terms of roles, so that if we interview someone and we find that they're at senior level, then that would fit it with one of the teams that would meet that senior level, or if, um, if they're more junior, then there are teams that we could we could uh, support them in better. So I wouldn't I wouldn't negate uh, that sort of information. I wouldn't put that information on levels within a job spec, and I try and keep it conversational. But what I'm doing is I'm having the conversations. I'm I'm trying to map in my head and and use the mental models where the candidate would fit on the career pathway. Um, are they going to be more this left-hand side at the junior level? Are they more uh, the junior scale of the, the, the team lead perspective, the management pathway? Or are they up at the, up, the, the, the right-hand side where like, they've got really strong skills and experience? Um, or that could be on the, the, the management pathway or the individual contributor pathway. And at the same time, we've got the skills um, model at the bottom, skills mapping, but again, this is a heuristic, it's not a checklist. Um, so I can kind of think about, well, in this area, they have, um, they're showing this level of experience, but in this other area, less so. So this is me building mental models using the career framework that we've got at Ada as well. Uh, just bringing that in as part of the interviews as well. Um, James spoke about this, interviewing is like testing, uh, be it from the candidate's perspective where they're interviewing the company or the company's perspective where they're interviewing the candidate. Um, where you think about testing, right? The exploration, we are assessing something, we are asking questions and trying to discover uh, information about that thing. Uh, and we're even, reporting and the fluency of us sharing our work. That's so many so many synergies with actually testing something uh, compared to interview. All of these things can be translated into the context of interview. So use your testing skills. Don't be afraid to use your testing skills as part of an interview if you're a candidate or if you're an interviewer. 
Um, the only difference is you're not testing a product, you're testing person, right? You're having a conversation and you're trying to obtain information from that person about the context of the role, if you're the candidate, the company, the culture, um, or in the, the flip perspective, if you're the, the interviewer, you're trying to discover information about the person's um, awareness of things in the craft, their knowledge, their skills, their experience, their behavior, their attitude, their actions, all these kind of things. Um, final slide is what, so what, now what? So these are great, regardless of your perspective, these are great, great questions to keep in your pocket. If you are um, assessing the company as a candidate, you think about what does this company do or want to do? Are you aligned with that vision? So what, why does this matter to the company? Does this also matter to you and your values? And then now what, where are they on their journey? What do they need to do in order to get there? And where do you see yourself fit within that as well? Can you envisage yourself making an impact in line with, uh, in, in line with this company's vision? And um, uh, if you're uh, an interviewer asking the candidate, you, you can ask the same things like, so what, what is it that you want to do? Um, there's many career pathways in testing. Um, why does it matter to you? Like, will this help you make an impact in these different areas that you could dive down? And um, what do you need to get to do this? So is there, is there a challenge with growing awareness or knowledge or skills or experience? Um, what do you need to do to progress into this role, essentially, or once you're in the role, to progress in your career? So these are three very useful questions to keep in your pocket. Uh, and that's me. Good luck with your next interview, if you're a candidate. Good luck with your career, <laughs> if you're just interviewing people. <laughs> so if I can pass it back over to you, Eric, yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I, I like seeing the uh, theme of um, interviewing as testing come out again. I think that that's that's really it. I'm looking forward to talking about that some more in our uh, in our roundtable later on in this in in, in this session. Um, but I think that's that's a really cool theme. All right, so now it's time for me to introduce somebody who really doesn't need an introduction, but they're getting one anyway. Uh, one of my very favorite people in testing uh, ever since I met her. I guess it would be six years ago in Vancouver, and my life is much richer for having known her, and uh, I'm really lucky I get to work with her occasionally these days uh, and get to associate with her and her family. Um, it may, it, it's, a, it's an honor for me to introduce Ash Coleman. Oh, Eric, you always do it. <laughs> I cannot express how much I love Eric. Eric is Uncle Eric, known lovingly in our home. He is the second dad to my beautiful, beautiful baby, Brooklyn. For those who followed along our family, you know that we've gone through quite a number of changes as has a lot of folks, uh, especially with COVID being on our coattails and in some cases in the forefront of our life these days, but that's neither here nor there, um, but am holding space for those who are still struggling with, with COVID and whatnot. But I was super excited that I got invited to this particular event. There have been some wonderful gems that have been dropped thus far. And what I have uh, as a presentation today and as a conversation piece more so is right in alignment with management. Um, I appreciate Dan, first of all, seeing you. It's been so long and I'm so glad that you're here, but also the way that you perfectly queued up uh, your career testers career. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. And I think it's important to understand a little bit about where I'm coming from. For folks who do know me know that I am a forever tester and have taken many uh, dips, turns, and moves within my career. Eric, I'm going to call you out. In the beginning, you talked about how you hate when folks leave testing through other avenues and go off to do other things. Um, and I'm one of those people. So in line with your beautiful introduction, I'm going to hold you to task here because I am one of those people you despise. But 
uh, I think that it was fruitful. So made my way through testing. Uh, I was a consultant. I was full time. Um, I worked uh, agile testing is kind of what I'm known for out there more so how to implement an agile process with testing in mind testing first and have moved through a number of opportunities that has seen a lot of my interests just completely clash and find great opportunities in my career. And so I'm gonna give y'all the secret sauce that I found along the way uh, that I used as a manager when I would coach and lead other folks and that I'm still using to this very moment on how I'm building my career, but more importantly, how everyone here can build their testing career. So one thing that I did this morning, I did a dry run with Zoom. My slides were not moving forward. So I'm gonna try to share them now. If they don't move forward, I did send them off to a friend to see if they can present for me, but let me start here to see if they will work for me first. We have a screen. Got it. We have presentation. Perfect. Now the, the trick is going to be whether we can see the move forward or not. That was the hiccup before, but that's all right. We'll, we'll figure it out. The grid. Oh, that's me. I already talked about it. Building successful careers. I love, love, love being a quality engineer manager so much. I love it because it's an opportunity to speak to some of the most important aspects of the business, right? I want to boost y'all for a minute because the tester role is not only a role that we constantly lean on and rely on to make sure that we're in alignment with our business deliverables, Quite honestly, it's a good space to sit and situate yourself when you're thinking about your business or your career goals, right? Uh, there's so much that goes into testing as we've heard and seen in the community. And even here today, there are many, many ways to show up as a tester in spaces where the conversation around producing amazing quality software is the highest priority. And so what does that mean for you as a quality engineer? What does that mean for you as a tester? And what I think it means, at least what it's meant to me is applying my best self and my best experiences towards helping a business understand the breadth of opportunity they have with what they're building for their customers. I know that was a lot, that was, that was a mouthful, it was crazy. Here's where I go into my uh, diversity stuffs as well, but each one of us has not only the skills, uh, I believe it was Eric earlier who talked about the skill set, the basic skills. Um, Chris, you talked about this as well, right? The yoke, those skills that we have where everyone's executing from. But then there's, there's the, the white, I'm gonna use the egg analogy, that kind of bleeds off of those skills and it's, what the rest of your contributions. You don't just show up to work every day as a bucket of skills. It's how you exercise them. It's how you show up and implement them. It's how you lead with them. It's how you build with them. And so those are the areas and focus that I wanna talk about today. And in this, there's going to be the conversation about how you advocate for testing as well. Because I think that that's important, not only how you're showing up and you're exemplifying not only your skills, but your value, but also how the business is able to see really the power of testing as a whole. So anyways, without further ado, are you seeing the next slide? It says intro. We are. Yes. <laughs> so excited, the test worked this time. Uh, so intro to this, I ran this quote by my husband. Y'all uh, know him on Twitter lovingly as VDS4, uh, but also folks know him as Martin Hinia. That is my number one in life. Uh, I ran this quote by him and he was like, I don't like it. So of course I had to include it in the slide because I'm always doing things that he doesn't like. Anyways, making the career that you want is going to rely on knowing what you want in your career. Now, I know this sounds redundant and dumb and all of the things that you would associate with just like bad puns, et cetera, et cetera. But so much of my career has leaned on this particular quote. Making the career that you want is going to rely on knowing what you want in your career. Now, you don't have to raise your hand, but think about your career and think about times where you might have felt lost or you didn't know where you're going or you didn't really think that the repetitive nature of testing was really gonna take you anywhere. And I use those specific examples because as a leader, as a manager, as a consultant, I've run into this conversation so many times. What am I doing here? 
this work is repetitive, especially with newer testers that aren't bloomed to the realities of how multifaceted testing is. It's repetitive work. I don't know where I'm going with my career here. And so I wanted to lean on that particular quote to take us through the rest of this conversation. And the first bit I'm gonna talk about is growth. Focus on the things that grow you irrespective of your role. Now, when we're talking about building successful careers, of course, we're going to say something like growth. But what I want to add to this conversation about growth is, where is your focus? When you're thinking about your career, the thing that you own, the thing that you take with you from organization to organization, to contract to contract, to job to job, right? What is the thing that you're, that's coming with you? Irrespective of the role, and I'm saying this because so many organizations that you're going to look at, and this kind of goes on the coattails with what um, Dan was just saying about interviewing, every job description is going to be just a slight bit different. Not a single one of them is going to be in alignment with what the competencies were from your previous organization to your next. And it's going to cut off in certain areas depending on level, et cetera. How many folks, and again, this is more rhetorical, but think to yourself, how many times have you gone from one role to the next? And the conversation was, oh, well, you're not senior enough for our senior title, or you're a little more junior, or you're too senior for this particular role. Each organization has the opportunity to express what they need based on their own leveling system. This is a little bit of my people work that I do these days coming in. We spend time, uh, I don't work exclusively with HR, but I am the head of diversity um, and inclusion at a FinTech company where we talk about how to grow individuals. And so often during those competencies, it is around what criteria are gonna fit into this particular level at our org, which means that it's not going to be the same at every organization you go for. And what this causes is usually a really hard time conceptualizing, am I really going to go from a senior to a mid-level? Am I really going to go from this level to this level when we're thinking about growth? When in reality, the focus on these things should come from what you want to grow in, irrespective of how your organization defines your success. Now, I know that's almost backwards, especially when you're thinking about the other things that come along with leveling and role, which are pay or equity or all of those other amazing things. And we'll get there. But the first thing I want you to think about is how do you personally want to grow in your, um, as a tester, in your space, in the projects that you're working on? What goals can you sit and say, these are the areas that I want to be, this is the person I want to be in a year? I believe someone needs to be admitted. That might be jumping in on my... Sorry, I took care of it. No worries. Let me get back to the Prezo. I'm going to have to exit out and then come back. Give me one second. That's a bug, y'all, not a feature. OK. Alignment. So this one's the one that always gets me. Uh, it gets me because it's not only a conversation about career growth, it's a conversation about equity. And I don't mean equity in the way of so much stock or RSUs that you have in your company, but more so around the equitable opportunities you have within your job to be able to excel you past where you want to go with your goals. Um, that was a lot of fluffy language here. Let me, let me dine it down for you. So alignment. Define your goals in alignment with business goals. The amount of times that I talk to testers and we discuss, that is amazing that you wanna do this particular thing. What does it have to do with the business goals? And then the answer being, I don't know, is wild. Think about it this way. A business is situated in a way where their bottom line is to make money to make money. Now, of course, there's all of the other engagement points that are necessary to keep talent like yourself, your amazing contribution, that bucket of skills that you came in the door with, etc. But at the end of the day, y'all don't get paid and nobody else gets paid if you are not making a product. And so the conversation usually comes back to what does this alignment look like? It is so profitable as a tester to understand what the business goals are so that anytime you talk about your goals, whether it's with your manager or anyone else on your team, that they have alignment. 
Here's the secret sauce. The reason is, is because when you align your goals within business goals or in terms of business goals, not only will you have the support of anyone who cares about the success of the business, it will include you in conversations around this person can contribute in this way with something that they're very passionate about working on. And it's not that hard. And I say that with ease because I've done it so many times at this point that it's really just about the language. And I know that we as testers know about the difference of good language in conversations and not necessarily helpful or bad language. And we're not gonna go into the diversity aspect of that on this particular piece. But we will talk about how do you have the conversation about your goals that legitimately fortify any goal that your business has. If the bottom line is about making money and getting the, uh, getting the product in as many hands as possible, you with your amazing contributions and your beautiful self can go to the business and say, I have a goal of maximizing my contribution in line with the business's bottom line of getting to the most folks by doing X, Y, and Z. Did that change your goal? No. But did it speak the language of alignment with business goals? Yes, it did. Very important point. The next is going to be lead. I love the conversations about leadership, especially as your career is heading towards management and whatnot. But to be completely fair and honest, you do not have to be a manager to lead. You do not have to be a manager to be a leader. And in fact, wherever you are, lift and direct. What I mean by that, and this is going into the test advocation or advocating for the testing that we're doing, is that when you get to a space and you are the expert in that space. Now, I know a lot of folks have hesitance around using the word expert, but let's be honest. Something that I learned more recently, especially as I'm working with more high-level individuals, is that when I enter that space, regardless of my role or what level that I might be in comparison to theirs, they're leaning on me to deliver information that they don't have a concept around. So in that way, you're the leader. You're the peer. You're the person who's coming to the table with the most knowledge there, and you have that ability to lift and to direct others in the right way. It could be as small as a ticket or some key result deliverable, or it could be an entire project. Wherever you are, lift and then direct others where you want them to go. And then the final piece, when we're talking about growing our testing careers, specialize and diversify. This has been my bread and butter from the jump. It's what am I the most passionate about? And folks who hang out with me or are on Twitter with me, I know I'm not mostly on Twitter these days, but those who have heard me speak have heard a few things that I'm very passionate about. Diversity, accessibility, and agile. Those are kind of my, that's my bucket. And what I do with that is I grow, let my interests and my experiences drive my career. Never once have I sat there and said, you know what, I'm going to take this uh, position or this role at a job and not apply my interests and my passion towards what I'm doing. It has helped me to lead conversations about accessibility in spaces where maybe it wasn't so fruitful. I've also been in organizations where, that were solely focused on accessibility. And that, special, that specialty within testing has helped me to be able to propel uh, into areas of my career that I never knew I could go. And it was purely because of my passion. There's this reality about passionate spaces that we're in where folks can understand how well and how much you enjoy something just based on the energy you're bringing to the conversation around it. Make whatever that is your specialty and go for it. And then on the diversify side, don't be afraid if it's something that is outside of everyone else's wheelhouse. Again, your contributions are what you're going to focus on. Your uh, diverse nature, your diverse interests that you bring to the table are going to be the thing that sets you apart from others. To be completely honest, you can't step into a space where someone else is and say that you're going to do something the same as they do it. It's all on you. And that's the important part about both being a specialist and someone who diversifies their bag. I always talk about diversified bag, whether it's money or career or opportunity. And so as you're advocating for opportunities in test or in, um, in the role that you're in, maybe you're taking more of a leadership role, make sure that you're helping others understand your passions and your interests 
by sharing those experiences and driving your career in that direction. So not to harp on that too much, but wanted to, let me, that is a bug, y'all. Let me exit out of here real quick again. There we go. So what this brings me to is the summary, and I'm going to call it career agility. I actually looked at this, um, I actually took these words and I put them in Google and I found quite a bit written on it. I was actually surprised, but nonetheless, career agility. I found this wonderful quote. Uh, An agile career path is a self-reflective incremental career path guided by response to change, evolving job roles, and designed to optimize creativity, growth, and happiness. Through these four points that I just took y'all through, hopefully you're seeing that there is opportunity beyond uh, what you might have even been privy to before, where in which you can align your passions, you can align your goals with the business, you can lead in spaces that you are the specialist in, you can recognize an area of testing that's solely yours with your spin on it, and you can go out and you can be great there. These are the areas. And also recognizing that the testing that was yesterday is not the testing that's tomorrow. I think that this is the most important part of this conversation, is that when you think about your career, in the opportunities you have to grow and to learn. Testing and engineering is transitioning and transforming faster than we know. And being open and malleable in that way and in that space, and especially within your growth and your goals is going to assist you in being the best tester that you can be. So in theory, that's all you need to know. And the rest is really up to you. And I know that, see all this, this photo came from, um, what is it? I have this course on LinkedIn and it, came with the slide really. No, I'm just kidding. It was the, uh, this photo is more about the point that I'm making here. I want it to be really, really, really uh, specific to this is your career. My career has led me into areas that I never imagined it would go. And that's why I included this photo to help you understand that whatever you can dream of, whatever your passion is, you'll be able to do it. So anyways, that's my inspirational talk. Thank you for coming to the TED talk. I'm all done. Thank you, Ash. Yeah. Okay, next up, um, we're gonna talk with Chris with Chris Kenst. So um, Chris, Chris uh, published a series of blog posts about his experience in uh, identifying, um, interviewing and hiring candidates. So what he'd like to do is to open the floor for, uh, as an ask me anything session. So the way we're gonna, the way I wanna like to facilitate this is to put it in the chat your question, and then uh, then then Chris can pick them out and um, repeat your question and answer it for you. So um, yeah, I think, uh, so go, so yeah, Chris, does that sound like a good idea? Is that how you'd like to handle yeah. it? Yeah, exactly. And I have some questions that people sent in from uh, Twitter and other places as well. Uh, so this, I'm sharing the article right now on the screen, um, so I can give a little bit of a background on it. And really, this is just like an ask me anything about, it doesn't have to be about the article itself, um, but it can also just be about uh, hiring and uh, testers. Uh, so I did, uh, as Eric said, so thanks Eric for the intro. Um, I recently did actually two rounds of hiring in Los Angeles here. I hired two software testers for exploratory testing roles. And the first round of those, I got uh, over 140 applications, I think 140 resumes. And because of just the sheer volume of resumes, I thought that I could do some data analysis on it and try and learn something about how uh, I hired, at least how people kind of progressed through that flow. Um, and so I, I wrote kind of an extensive blog post about, uh, you know, some of the mistakes that I made, who the context of the, the number of people, the number of resumes and like their experience, where they applied from. Uh, I tried to like try and understand whether like um, the gender of the people who are applying just because I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, I tended to focus on people applying who had uh, experience in software testing and even education in software testing. Um, and it also turns out that I didn't like reading resumes basically beyond four pages. So that's kind of what prompted this idea of, I bet a lot of you have questions about hiring or interviewing people, either you're applying to places, 
and you kind of want some feedback or um, you know you you just want to know like how uh, a hiring manager looks at things so everyone's being shy so that's great i'll ask the first question go ahead um give me an idea of what your first scan of a resume uh the, the 30 to 60 seconds where you're deciding whether you want to read it in depth or not what are you looking for what what helps you decide whether this is a live one or not yeah, I'm trying to look and see from a high level on so the first 30 or 60 seconds, I'm trying to see if I can, um, like, it's kind of like a blink test where I'm looking and trying to see if, if it's going to be possible to understand what this person has done. Uh, and it turns out that's why the pages matter. Because if I'm scrolling through a resume and I'm like, oh, I see it's like two pages, I can see that this person has been working for six or eight years. Uh, I can then like conceptually kind of top down understand, okay, they, they have a relevant number of ex amount of experience. And then I can probably go through and read through those individual sections and understand their story. And if it's too long within that 30 to 60 seconds where I can't make that blink test and I can't kind of in my mind relatively quickly understand how long they've been doing this and uh, then, then it becomes a lot more difficult and time consuming to spend on it. And I probably move on. So, uh, John, is it, I never know if it's Jonathan or I'm going to go with Jonathan, but I know you, uh, from Slack is John, but, uh, Jonathan Beller says, I see a lot of resumes that are very generic and they list testing terms. Um, yeah, so I do too. Uh, I, I use those testing terms when I did the data analysis, but it doesn't really help me at all when people like list out testing terms on on uh, resumes or keywords. I think most people tend to do that as a, a, re a way to get through filters online uh, when they're applying to places. But I personally am uh, somebody who likes to uh, be able to read through and have a conversation about a resume. Uh, James, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Um, what about your process changed over the course of this analysis? I assume you were doing at least some of it uh, during the, the process. Yeah. So the whole reason of doing this was because I wanted to kind of go back and understand my process a bit better. And um, it. so one of those things was like I started to realize that I didn't uh, like reading long resumes uh, because the first like 10 of them were very long and I read through them and it was really hard to make decisions on. And then I started going, I think this hard decision is because like, it's hard to encapsulate a 10 page resume and for me to understand what they're doing. Um, so it became one of those things where I was like, okay, shorter resumes, I can actually understand what they're doing and make a relative decision. Um, one of the things that uh, is probably not listed in this article was actually in phone interviews. So I was talking, we were talking before this uh, with Dan and one of the things that like I do when I interview people for phone interviews is I give them a testing exercise and it turns out just over uh, giving people testing exercises, you see where people fall down on the testing exercise. And then you go, is that because the person doesn't know what they're doing or is it because I didn't provide enough structure and guidance around my example? that the same people are just falling over and over. And so there's lots of small things that you kind of incrementally adjust when you're interviewing. Um, I see this all the time too, when my company Promenade, we're hiring for a lot of roles. One of them is a VP of engineering role. And I'm asked to interview, I'm asked to interview DevOps engineers and VP of engineers and uh, of engineering. And these are roles that I don't understand, but uh, what, tends to happen and what my CTO does is he gives us the weakest candidates first and the strongest candidates later because he knows that just through trial and error that as an interviewer you just kind of get better uh, which is frustrating for people who are doing who are interviewing because you might be the first person to interview on a team and that interview team might be terrible because they don't have practice yet. Uh, okay, so Dan asks, what's the most creative resume that you've seen? Any models or mind maps? 
Uh, I don't have any models or mind maps. The most creative resumes, I'll be honest, uh, I think Jonathan mentioned like a lot of resumes are really generic. And so the best resumes that I've seen, and again, this is in my context where I've gotten hundreds of resumes and I'm literally looking through hundreds of them, right? And so the ones that stand out the most are the ones that where someone took time to design them. Uh, so they look a bit more like, I don't, if you've seen Dan's, uh, there was a tweet that went out with it, but like colorful resumes where people have really taken the time to kind of craft it. That's not just like a Word doc or a PDF. Uh, they should be in PDF format, by the way, but they actually are, um, someone took the time to curate what is being presented in front of you. And it might be colorful. It's definitely something that kind of shows your individual nature. Those are some of the best that kind of like click, uh, whether they're logos or graphics or any of those kinds of things. But I've never seen anybody put a model or mind map in a resume. That would be pretty impressive if they did that though. FYI, I'm not saying you should do a cover letter, but maybe if your cover letter had a mind map in it, that would be pretty, pretty amazing. So one of the questions that I got on Twitter was, um, what are things that candidates can do to prepare for them uh, for, for interviews? And so when you are going to an interview, there's a certain amount of due diligence that's kind of expected. Like you, you should hopefully know what role you're applying to and what the job description said. Um, it's understandable that sometimes you will have been, you will have uh, applied to a lot of roles and, and maybe you won't remember, but it's always good to keep notes. Um, but in terms of preparing for an interview, you should uh, ideally have just a, a slight background about the company. So I'll say that just anecdotally, whenever I've interviewed somebody and they at least have a concept of what the business is, that makes the interview go much smoother. So it's not like I would expect anybody to spend more than 10 or 15 minutes kind of doing research. But if you have a basic background of what, what the company does, it definitely lowers barriers on both the interviewer and interviewee side, and it makes things go a lot smoother. Uh, you, you always get a few brownie points if you actually know what the company does as opposed to just kind of blind. It's not a negative if you don't, it's just kind of like you get a few brownie points You're like, oh, okay, this person prepared a little bit, I see. Uh, so that's always good. Anybody else have a question? Uh, Tony asks, um, many job descriptions have a large set of requirements attached to them. Should a person apply anyway if they don't meet every requirement? Yeah, you should. Um, you should definitely apply. And here's the thing that when you're applying, it takes a little bit more time, but if you can uh, craft your resume and even at, it depends on the uh, way that you apply to a job, but if you meet just some of the requirements, especially around, I think it was Dan that said that they don't, he doesn't put like senior or, or uh, associate titles or any of that kind of stuff in there. Um, and I think even James said this too, because you want flexibility as a hiring manager about who, who you're gonna, um, who you're willing to look at, right? So if you don't think you're a senior person, um, but you think that you, it, the skills that you have probably match that job, you should apply. And you should um, ideally be able to address those things either in your resume or in a comment as you're applying. Like, hey, I know this is for a senior level. I don't may not have the right experience, number of years experience, but like, this is why I think I'm a good uh, applicant for this job. Um, it should be something you can talk to that you can like get around those objections, but it should not block you from doing it. Dan says, why have so many requirements in the job description if they don't matter so much. Yeah, so this is uh, something that bothers me. So I write my own job descriptions for this reason. I literally had an internal recruiter. I sent them my job description, they rewrote it, and I rejected all their changes because they wanted to put things in there like an attention to detail. And I'm like, yes, but if you're not gonna test for an attention to detail, then why would you ask for it? So personally, all the things that I look for in, uh, that I test people for, that I ask people to prove or, or I ask them about are things that are in the job description. 
and I don't like having a lot of fluff. And as James says, and he mentioned in his talk too, yeah, you've got to know your mission as the hiring manager and your advertisement, your, your job description or, or job requirement should, should flow from that. Come on, there's people on this call. I know you have questions. Yeah, yeah, there's, um, there's definitely some back and forth. So uh, <laughs> you change your name, John. All right, uh, what sort of question would you give to an automation engineer candidate uh, to test their testing related coding skills? Um, yeah, so for applying for automation engineers, uh, I give take home assignments. Actually, I give take home assignments for my testers and for my automation engineers. And so, I, because for me, that's a uh, thing that that's a job requirement is you need to be able to code, you need to be able to write some automation. Um, I don't know that I'm going to ask a ton of technical things during an interview. There, there are some things, uh, even if I was hiring for an automation engineer, I would give you an example, a phone interview, probably where we would step through an application, I'd ask you to test it. Uh, but ultimately, for coding skills for an automation engineer, I would give you a take home assignment and probably ask you to uh, automate something. And then we would review your code afterwards. And when reviewing your code, then I would ask you things about why you did this. Like, what, why did you take this approach? What did you run into? We would have conversations about the work that you did because that's what is going to apply. And then I would like to, you know, from there, I could understand your thinking about how you approach something. Uh, Tony asks, there are opinions on both sides on having either a, having either on a resume, wait a minute, so, not sure I, I Having a understand. single resume or customizing resume for specific yeah. jobs? Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, this is, this is a good one. So, um, there needs to be some tailoring. So if you're in a testing role and you're applying to a testing role, you're probably fine. Um, if you've had other jobs in the past, which is totally fine, you need to have a, you need to tell that story. And that story has to apply to the job you're at, right? So if you've been in product management and you want to move into testing, your, um, job description or, or your objective, if you have one in there, needs to address that, right? Because as Ash, uh, as Dan said, like the first thing that, I think it was Dan, we've talked to so many people, so many great presentations. Uh, the resume is the first thing that we often look at. Sometimes there'll be a comment or something in there. And so if you kind of like blindly apply to something, um, it's really hard to tell whether you applied or uh, if you made a mistake. And so I'm, I'm not a fan, like you shouldn't have 10 different resumes, but you should be able to tailor and make some small modifications, maybe 10 or 15 minutes when you're applying for a job. If you think that your current resume does not um, explain why you're applying to this position. Does that help? Has being active in the community helped with you with recruiting? Uh, a little bit, yeah. It actually has helped get some applicants. I will say that just having a larger network and one of the things that I've been trying to do just on LinkedIn, because LinkedIn is such a great source for resumes, is I'm making sure that my, my community and the people that I'm connected with is also a lot broader. Uh, so I'm not just trying to connect with like white dudes. Uh, I'm also trying to make sure that like looking at my network and seeing that like if I'm not just connected to people in Los Angeles, but connected to people in other cities and like, am, you know, am I connected to uh, a bunch of women in the testing space and that kind of thing. Um, that definitely helps because it's kind of the larger net, the network you have, the more potential applicants you have that will see what you're doing. Um, Twitter, I've even gotten some people that have applied on through Twitter, which is which is pretty cool. Um, and some of the the uh, Slack channels that I posted to. Okay, when interviewing, one of the things I usually ask the candidates to do a rough product coverage outline on, on an app on a toy application. I found some people would get lost in trying to express their understanding. To solve that, I started doing it with a pairing process. 
What do you think of that approach? Any tips to pair up properly? Uh, so I've done pairing in person. It's harder to do virtually. So there's that dynamic. Uh, all the hiring that I've done has been in COVID. So I definitely take a much more hands-on approach when I do hire. Um, so I haven't done any pairing in COVID times virtually. Uh, so I can't talk to that. But um, every time that I'm done interviewing, I always kind of write myself a retro on what went wrong and what, like what went well, right? So if I think that I was too hands-on with somebody, then I ask myself, why was that? Was that because they didn't have the experience? Was it because the thing I asked them to do wasn't clear? Uh, so there's always chances to learn, but I don't, I don't specifically have too much experience pairing virtually for hiring. Okay, I think um, we're, we reached the time to open up this to a larger panel. So I want to invite uh, James, Dan, and Ash to join us and ask some questions and to have a more have a more open discussion. Um, I, I want to start out with some with something that you uh, mentioned to me is the concept of recruiting. That when you're trying to build a staff with some really good people, it's not enough to just passively accept resumes showing up and hope you can find some gems that um, especially for my key hires, uh, knowing people that I wanted to work with, knowing people I wanted to hire and the value as a manager of knowing people like that. Um, I think uh, if, I, if, I got another, if I got another senior leadership position in testing, there are people in my network that I would check in with and wanna see what they were doing and whether they were thinking about a change. And that puts me um, way ahead of the game, especially as you move up in management, that's part of your responsibility is to go find good people and bring them into your org, not just let your, uh, well, I'll, I'll just, I'll set aside the HR department thing. That's a whole other conversation. Um, anyone else have something to talk about, about actively recruiting as a, as a hiring person or, um, or, so, or working in, in, in working in hiring? I wanna say too that um, hiring too is, is such a timing thing. So like, you know, I, I hire for like a three week period of time. So I'm hoping that you're available during that time. <laughs> One trend that I do like uh, is when people advertise that they are looking for jobs. Uh, so I've seen blog posts, Twitter, that kind of thing, basically anywhere in your community that you're, that you're connected, putting it out there that you're looking for a job is super helpful if you have credibility in your community, right? Because I've seen a couple of people where they've tweeted out or said something and I knew that they were looking and I knew I was about to hire and I could ping them and be like, two weeks, two weeks, and I'm going to have a job description and you'll be the first one in, right? Um, so, it, you know, timing plays a big deal and knowing when people are looking is hugely beneficial. Um, I'd agree with Chris on that. Um, one of the reasons that I started blogging uh, probably 10 years ago was to build a bit of profile that would help with recruitment. And I think taking the opportunity on my blog to make it clear what my values around testing were so that I could attract the kind of people that I wanted to work with as testers uh, really paid dividends. Uh, and also uh, writing a kind of um, job advert that I would want to apply for uh, and that I thought people, the kind of people I wanted would want to apply for made a really big difference. Uh, I also got quite active uh, Slack channels, jobs boards, those kind of things. I wouldn't rely on HR to stick the job ad in the places uh, that were important. I'd go and do that myself. Yeah, I, I was just going to add that it's hard though because some people may not advertise that they're looking for a job because they might be in a job and they don't want their company to know. So <clears throat> that's where I find if you, like what James was saying, they're advertising the roles, but maybe targeting communities and uh, diverse communities as well so that you can share that you're you have these open roles so that people can actually apply as well um yeah it has to be two ways like i don't think i've ever publicly announced on social media that i've been looking for a job before but that's something i would probably feel uncomfortable with <laughs> usually that works when you've been let go and you are not at a current company uh that's a, a great thing but yes sharing on slack also means that so like a, as a uh, hiring manager, I'll share on Slack, and then people can privately message me, um, which is very, very nice because they can be like, hey, I'm thinking about, can I get more details? Absolutely. Sure. We can have a conversation. 
um, which is very, very nice. One thing that I'll just add on that one is that uh, I personally am in the camp of I'm always looking regardless of what my employment status is. And so I appreciate when folks reach out, it puts the ball in my court. It helps me to be able to direct or guide. And quite honestly, uh, especially from a diversity perspective, there is a huge area of opportunity when you're doing things for equitable uh, enhancement for your diverse community that other companies aren't doing. So if you approach someone and you know your diversity game is on point, that's the big selling point. A, a person will leave a job for a better opportunity. Um, it doesn't have to be that you're unemployed to keep looking. And I know that that is, that is a situation in the case, but just speaking from personal experience on that one. Yeah, I want to go a little bit more on that. Um, the thing I wish someone had told me when I was starting my career is that all of the stuff about our employees are our family is bullshit. You know what, the, 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 the idea that um, you owe loyalty to an employer, not true. That's what the money's for. And, I, and I'm, I'm never not listening to people and I'm never would say um, I'm off the market. Nobody talk to me. Mm -hmm. um, there are times where, some, where I'll, I'll say, you know, thanks, this doesn't sound like a good match for me, but um, you, should, you, you should always be listening for the better opportunities. You have a limited career you're going to have only so many jobs in your lifetime and you need to be ready to, you need to be ready to do what's right for you. Yeah. Um, I know so many talented people who just keep waiting for some employer who sees them as a commodity, doesn't really care about them to someday come down and tap them on the shoulder and say, thank you so much. Here's incrementally more money to do more work. And that's a terrible way to go about managing your career and engaging with it. I cannot echo that enough. My motto is always be interviewing. Uh, there, you cannot um, put your loyalty in companies. At the end of the day, they have a bottom line. And whether your career path coincides with that or not, you're not going to get that tap on the shoulder like Eric said. So I appreciate you bringing up that point, Eric. So important. I wonder if I could play devil's advocate a little bit though, because like I've worked in companies that have been atrocious, like really challenging. It feels like a battle going into work. So I, I, I get it, like I would move, I've moved from those companies, but I've also worked in companies that were really good. Not be good because I'm getting lots of praise, but good because I'm actually enjoying it. It's good people that I'm working with. So in those cases, I would actually say, actually, I'm not looking at the moment, I'm enjoying it here. Like, my intrinsic motivations what matters to me and this is in a really good spot at the moment you know so there's that that might encourage people to say no and it's hard because if if uh, another company that's like bigger more reputational um throwing a lot more money your way taps your shoulder it would just be a really challenging situation to say, right, okay, I'm always open, let's have a conversation, I'm going to take this and leave something that's good for something that turns out to be not so good. Uh, I would really struggle with that. So I'm, I'm just playing devil's advocate, but I do agree with you. <laughs> but just in case, like, there are people that are like, well, I, I'm not actually looking at the moment and I wouldn't want to look. So it's interesting. And not to uh, keep this particular piece of the conversation moving, uh, a conversation I had with someone who's leaving uh, one of the, the companies I support right now, phenomenal job. Um, they, they loved every bit of it and staying, even though it was a good job, is not something that they were able to do because they are fighting a number of other uh, very important pieces to what the complete package of salary looks like. And being specific, the pay was not in alignment with what other jobs were, were offering. Um, and speaking from personal experience, and this is not, I recognize we have an international audience, so it's not always going to be the case. Here in America, when there are job opportunities that are presenting more equity, more money, uh, it is almost tempting for any historically excluded person, and I'll speak again to my experience as a Black woman, if you're going to help me combat the historical systemic issues that come along with um, being in this particular body by providing me more money that is going to assist me in that generational wealth gap that exists, 
I'm going to choose that almost any time, regardless of if the next gig is not as glamorous or as beautiful as the pre one previous. Um, and there's, there's so much of that here. Again, I'm not speaking international, I'm speaking from an American perspective. There have been jobs that I've loved and I've left because they didn't pay me enough and they didn't have enough opportunity for me to be able to combat that. Uh, so devil's advocate on your devil's advocate, Dan. Um, but also we are very different countries and the way that that looks in each of them is different. I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, you should, you should, you should, you need to secure the bag. Um, unless you start your own company, if you want to retire comfortably, send your kids to college, take care of things, you need to make money, you need to take care of your family. Um, I think a lot of times um, employers will try to embarrass you about being money motivated. And yeah, I wouldn't go if they didn't pay me. I'm absolutely money motivated. Otherwise, I'd sleep in and, and really get, you know, become one with my PS5. You have to pay me to get me to show up. So yeah, yeah, we're all money motivated. Okay, I want to talk about um, a, a shift a little bit to the thing I um, put a marker down earlier about trying to hire despite an HR department and dealing with recruiters. Um, this is something I've really struggled with, with getting the right job description out there and with getting my candidates sent to me. And unfortunately, there have been times where I've just said, you know what, I'll screen, Never mind. Let me have the queue. I don't care if 100 resumes show up this week. Just let me at them because I don't trust. I don't like that you're throwing people out for not having a degree. I don't like that you're throwing people out because um, you don't see the word Java on their resume. Uh, what? Any advice about dealing with HR departments and recruiters and how to get to the candidates you're hoping to see? Oops. <laughs> no, so like one of the first things I do is try and spend time with the recruiters to teach them in the same way that I would try and teach testers so that and, I, and we'll have fun with it and they will actually, they tend to see the value because they're the ones that are recruiting for these roles. And if they can better understand the role, then it's going to be easier. Yeah, so there's the teaching aspect, but then there's the doing what you just said that you do, like stepping in and saying, well, I will help you review these candidates. Sometimes I'll look at their, the, their pile of rejections and I'll sort of scan through to see, actually, is there anything that I can teach them here with a candidate that would have made it through mass screening, but they've been blocked for some things. Typically, they work to checklists, so I assess their checklists and try and mold them so that it's more, more effective or actually try and get rid of the checklists and teach them more about how to have the conversations. Um, so there's quite a few things, but I don't think any of them on their own would work on their own. I think an accumulation of it all tends to help. Um, I'll add, I've tried to be upfront and say, oh, look, I'm not trying to be an arse, but I really care about getting good candidates. Uh, and that means that I'm going to, you know, want to ask a lot of questions about how you're assessing them. Or I've done this, the kind of thing that you said, Eric, I've just had everything come to me and I've, I've been the filter and then tried to explain why I've picked the candidates that I have. Um, uh, I've got a friend who's paired on interviews with recruiters and although I've offered that to several people from HR, I've never managed to actually achieve it. I don't know if anyone else on the panel has managed to do that. I've come from a smaller company, so uh, we didn't have HR. And when we had recruiters, uh, they were so overwhelmed that I could just tell them to not bother and so that's that's why I wrote these articles, right? It's because I literally had just I was the person that posted the job description, wrote the job description, and screened for all those people. I am curious to see how that changes as we grow. We've doubled in size in you know six months, uh, and so we're going to hire like we're actually going to hire an HR person now because we've had one, well, not actually had one. Um, so there, there is some level of like, I would probably do what Dan said, which is coach them. Like, listen, like these are the things that I wouldn't exclude somebody for, why are you, right? Uh, Cause that's not what I want. I think it's just a lot of setting expectations, but it also depends on the organization and what they're used to. Um, 
any any questions from the um, attendees about uh, you'd like to see us talk about or uh, in, um, anything we should revisit from earlier? Oh, I've got one. Uh, to Tony mentioned um, interviewing being a skill. Um, I think that uh, I think that knowing how to interview matters a lot. I think the thing I've most the, the my best my best interviews have been. And I mean, this is kind of like, you know, this is the, I don't know if this is, this is scummy or not, but I try to tell myself as I walk into the interview, you don't need this job. Relax. It's going to be fine. They're lucky that you showed up to talk to them. And that kind of confidence and like, like gassing yourself up goes a long ways and in, in just getting you to a stable point where you are, you can, you can be free and you can say what's on your mind and you can, um, and you you can have the conversation with a good hiring manager and not get cl or get clamped up or worse is to filibuster so that people feel like they can't get a question in edgewise just take take her easy um go into it you know, fi figure out how to be calm when you walk in and uh things will go well um because there are uh there are other places you can interview you don't need i don't you don't need to put too much on it this is why that concept of always be looking uh, is helpful because if you already have a job and you're just looking out for the things that could be better, there's a lot less pressure on you to do well on this one particular interview on this one particular time. Tony asks, how do you draw the line between confidence and cocky? I think it's being yourself. I always right. get cocky. Every <laughs> single time because I'm an expert in what I do. And I'm not saying that to be pompous, I'm saying it to be honest. Every interview that I've been in where I'm speaking confidently about the work that I can do, I get cocky. I get the feedback that I'm being cocky. So I think again, it's what body you exist in. And hopefully as we move forward, we are recognizing that the respectability politics of interviewing just can't land continuously if we're looking to be more diverse in our hiring practices. Yeah, you got to remember that ha that a lot of the time when people tell you you're being cocky, they're trying to they're trying to tell you that you you're freaking them out, that you're exceeding their expectations for what you should be doing right now. They're giving they're pushing back on you, they're trying to shut you down. They like I don't like that you're confident. You're supposed to be a supplicant to me. You're not supposed to be acting like like I'm lucky to talk to you. And you know that's a that's an interview. Remember, you're interviewing the place too when you go to an interview. If your hiring manager is a dick, um, you definitely don't want to work for him. One of the things that uh, my the engineering team and I talked about on, on my company um, was that we look for people who are really opinionated and we notice when people aren't really opinionated. So we don't necessarily take it as cocky, but somebody who like understands what it is that they're doing and has a particular way. And we actually see opinionated as somebody who's like, just like really particular, this is the way they like to go. And we tend to respect that because we find that we're also very similar to that. Uh, so. Like maybe if we were interviewing Ash, she'd be like, she's really opinionated. We like this. Like, you know, that's, it depends part of it as how you take it too. where you're like, she knows so well what she's doing that she has this particular uh, way of going about it. So it depends on the team and the environment. And Tony, just to be clear, uh, this was all the feedback was in a negative way. In other words, like these were jobs that passed up on exactly what they're looking for. And I was able to deliver because there was hesitation around my demeanor, right? Um, and so it's a very fine line. The opinionated part, I wouldn't even say that I'm necessarily opinionated. I'm experienced. I'm experienced and I'm thorough. And so if you're asking specific questions, I'm gonna walk you through the process of how you get to that solution. So I, I think opinionated also is another facet of how do you implement a diversity of thought, opinionated individuals. There's the additional questions on what sort of container are we creating for folks to be able to come to the table as opinionated individuals? Do we have enough for the facilitation for a number of opinionated um, 
conversations. And again, it's where you're interviewing because some companies might not be built for that. Um, I'll say the last thing I would say about this is um, I I feel like I look for, I, I have a hard time find, finding testers who can give an opinion. And I'm willing to put up with an awful lot um, to find somebody who can um, advance a project or can um, get uh, get a get a view of quality into the planning for that project. Um, so those are those are people I'm looking for, not just to advance as managers, but just you know testing a lot of a lot of testing is lone is the lone gun person thing where you show up at a project, everyone else is trying to ship, and you're the person who's trying to bring some order to things and help help people um, keep their own commitments about quality. So I, I, it, it, so a, a person who is very quiet or has a hard time speaking up um, can be an effective tester in some roles, but may struggle if they're the only person on a project where, where people are in a mania of hurry to be able to say no or to say, you know, I think we, I think we should spend more time in this. I don't think this is good enough to release and so forth. Um, okay, let's, let's, let's play roulette. Um, let's pick, a, let's pick someone on the panel. And what's something that you that you've heard earlier today that you would like to talk about? Uh, and I will pick James. Um, well, I would love to do that, Eric, and I, I do have something and it would come to you. But I'll say that uh, John's got a question in the chat. So let me tell you what the question to you would be. Uh, your talk. Uh, was a lot about uh, management and not very much about testing. Is there something about test managers, uh, some requirement for test managers that actually includes their testing ability or testing experience or something? Or do you think that test managers don't need that background? Um, but let, let, let's get to uh, John's question first as he, as he added. Uh, John, you want to hear uh, about hiring for senior roles or roles where people might have skills you or the team doesn't have yet? Um, I think uh, I'll, go, I'll go first on that one since I'm talking. Um, I think that's a re really interesting one. For the senior, less so. Um, for myself, I have the same kinds of requirements, but at a different level for junior or seniors. I'll be looking for all the same kind of characteristics and the extent to which the candidates exhibit them will kind of help me judge where in my context they fit so sort of on the junior to senior uh, spectrum. Uh, roles where the... Uh, people might have skills the team doesn't have yet. Um, if I can get someone from another department who's got something that crosses over with what I'm looking for, I'll, I'll get them involved. Um, I've had other people, you know, non-testers on tester interviews before, or if not, I'll take responsibility and learn something about that thing myself so that I can at least ask sensible questions. I've been prepared not to know everything when the candidate answers, but I want to know enough that I can tell whether they're credible. I think that credible is a, um is a judgment. I don't think you can, I don't think you, you if, if your interview is validating that a person has a skill on their resume, you're probably talking about the wrong thing. Um, if you, if, if you're not going to be able to in a 30 minute or 60 minute um, session, um, pr you know, prove to your, pr you know, prove to uh, yourself that this person really understands um, how to write Selenium. Um, you pick in a couple questions, you see how they, how they answer. You, you, and you kind of form an you kind of form an opinion. And a lot of this is tacit. A lot of this is stuff from body language and things you don't understand that you're picking up. If I believe that this person knows what they're talking about, the people they're going to work with will probably believe they know what they're talking about as well. And that's probably the best I can do in an interview. I can't like rate somebody on a scale of 10 how good they are at test automation, not in one interview. Honestly, what I love seeing in addition to that, when it comes to uh, skills that your team doesn't have yet, there's always this conversation, especially in more senior roles about what mentorship this individual can bring to the team. And yet it's the last, uh, it's either the last area that we, we really inquire about in an interview or we don't talk about it at all. And so if this is a new skill that's coming to the team, the first things that I wanna know is how are you gonna bring folks along for that journey? 
what I've seen is that when you hire folks with new roles that are with new skills that don't necessarily uh, or haven't been exemplified within the team yet, they either silo themselves and the experience with engagement is not very great for them or folks constantly complain of not knowing what they're doing. So the question that I would have for that individual is, how are you going to bring folks along? Not in the way of validating your skill, but in the way of that real connectivity around how do you work as a team? And that usually helps me get a good idea on not only am I hiring the right person, I'm hiring a really strong individual because anyone that can explain something that's deeply um, complex in a simple way is going to be a person I want to have around for the many questions that are going to come about the introduction of this new skill set on the team. I've been in that position many times as well. Like the, I've joined companies where I've been asked to set up the testing function within the organization, right? So that's predominantly engineers that have never worked with testers before and then having to inject that role in there. So the starting point is different, right? The starting point is on awareness. It's not lack of skill, lack of knowledge. It's that they're completely unaware of this role. They've never worked with testers before. So that's where perhaps I would look for some of this more senior initially. But I'm looking at their fluency and being able to talk about the craft, teach the craft. So it's not really 100% role of being a tester. It's like a split. It's maybe 30 to 40% doing testing initially and 60% is going to be, 60 to 70% is going to be teaching, coaching, mentoring, talking about the craft, showing their work that they do. So they're the skills I would interview for. But what I found really interesting, and this is from teaching people in the community as well, through the, the uh, testing essentials course that me and Mark Wintering and do, we've helped people change careers into testing. But what we've found is, let's go back to the second part from John, like discovering skills that people have that haven't been introduced to the team. There's people that have come from such a diverse background. There was someone that was a nurse that was wanting to get into testing. And actually what I saw from hiring this person into the team was that their nursing skills come through. Their people skills from being a nurse was the most valuable skill set that they could bring into the team at that point in time. So it's not just about testing skills that the team aren't aware of. It's actually about what did people do before they were a tester, right? Because a lot of people fall into the craft, right? There's common stories that we share about falling into testing. So what did you do before you were testing and how do you bring that into the team? And a lot of people that are testers revolve around people. It's the way that we see it is, is people that build software for people, right? So we build a lot of sociology skills and psychology skills and thinking skills and collaboration skills. So bringing those stories into the interviews really helps as well. That's what I think. Thanks everyone for the answers. Very helpful. We got one last question that um, we'll end on this. Uh, we got from Alexander. Um, did you ever hire someone and regret? Uh, regret it. Now, how did you deal with that? Can you share some hiring mistakes? Um, I have absolutely done that. Um, when I when it's happened to me, or when I've done it to myself, I should say, has been when I just wanted somebody. It was taking too long to hire someone. Um, I convinced myself it was a short-term role. I convinced myself it was a junior role and I compromised on my standards for hiring somebody. That's, I, I feel like um, almost all the time I can, I can point at that, but sometimes you're just wrong. You know, uh, 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 an interview is an interview uh, cycle. It's not a lot of time to make a value, make a, a, an informed judgment from. Um, sometimes you could just have gotten the wrong vibes or you've, you've, misjudged what somebody's capable of doing or you know they you you met their representative in the interview and it, who they really are is different and so it's it, there are going to be some misses it's um you know bugs get to production yeah i mean for me the word regrets quite difficult i, I don't think i've regretted i don't know but i have made it much harder for myself like there's been situations where I've hired people that I consider friends in the community. And because they're friends in the community, first and foremost, it's then harder to manage that person. So I've not regretted hiring that person. I've just found it really difficult working with them from a manager perspective. And 
I try to be like a civil leader as much as possible, but I just found it really difficult in that context. So I guess thinking about that word regret, it probably wasn't strong enough for me to say I shouldn't have hired this person, right? Because they were making an impact in the role, but but they were not making an impact in certain things that I feel like they should have been, right? And uh, yeah, that, that was certainly challenging. <laughs> I definitely agree with you, Dan. Uh, I don't, there, there's, there are sprinkles of regret. Um, it is more in line with the expectations. Uh, also, aside from the impact, how am I able to manage this individual? And some of the things that I have recognized from those experiences is I'm real good at coaching other folks through that same experience now. And the higher you climb in your career, the more you realize that a number of folks are dealing with how to manage folks who don't align with their standards or people who aren't credentialed for the role. Uh, and it becomes incredibly important to have that lived experience because it's super complex all the time. And just like any area uh, that we would test in software, we have to look at a number of different angles, inclusive of maybe this team just isn't the right team for this individual. What does retention look like? And then from a business perspective, what would it look like to turn over this role to someone new, hire someone new into the role, et cetera. So it just gets more and more complex. That's not to say that, again, there aren't sprinkles of regret uh, or that it could have been avoided. I think that it's more around what are the learning lessons? I sound like such a dummy on this one, but what are the learning lessons uh, that you can take away from it? And uh, what are the opportunities that may be at the organization that just aren't within your wheelhouse? Uh, I don't mind saying regret. Uh, I have recruited and I had two, di two different regrets, uh, recruited badly. Um, the first regret was that I let myself be persuaded by the other people on the interview panel that the candidate was good enough, despite my own misgivings. And the, that led, um, in this particular case, to him not being able to do the job that either he wanted to be able to do or that I needed him to be able to do. And uh, to Ash's point, um, even with the kind of coaching and assistance that I was able to give, he still wasn't um, able to, to do the work. And he, he recognized before I had to pull the plug that, that he needed to, to change roles. Uh, and he, he said, you know, it's not working out for me. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave. Um, but it wouldn't have been very long before I'd have had to have let him go as well. It was, it was really bad experience for everybody. And I regret that I allowed myself to be persuaded. Okay, um, we're a few minutes over. So I think uh, we're gonna have to wrap it up now. Um, I really enjoyed this. I hope we can do this again sometime. Um, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Ash and Dan and James and Chris who had to leave for another meeting. And I've got one in nine minutes too, because uh, we're at work. Uh, but thanks for spending a little time with us and sharing sharing this. Uh, we did record this session. Um, we'll put it out on, we'll put it out uh, probably within the next few weeks and make it so that it'll be publicly shared. Um, we uh, have some events coming up uh, that I'd like to talk, talk to you about briefly, like 30 seconds. Uh, we have a, uh, a, a just-in-time testing matinee that um, Rob Saberin is running on weekends uh, that's starting in about a week, um, so you can participate in that over time. It's a really great um, tutorial I've done in a two-day format. Um, I recommend it. Um, we've also announced our, uh, our June tutorial Growing a DevOps Culture with Lisa Crispin and Melissa at uh, Eden Look for more uh, from us on that shortly. And uh, there is a BBST course starting up in just a, in, in just a week or so on test design, uh, which is a pretty fun BBST course. Uh, so thanks, everyone. Uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you for coming.